anaphylactic shock from the local anesthesia that had been injected into my skin combined with very, very low blood sugar. And so I very, very, very slowly got out of my body and then I popped out and I was standing in front of it going, I didn't know you could do that. (laughs) So I got the answers to all those questions downloaded, you know, in the form of knowings. And after getting all those knowings, I was angry. I'm surprised that you can be angry in the afterlife, but I was angry. I am. I felt betrayed. You know, I felt like everybody knew this, but me, I just, I'm, must be stupider in the dirt. If I didn't know this, everybody's got to know this and they wouldn't tell me. My parents wouldn't tell me the truth. My church wouldn't tell me the truth. My school wouldn't, Catholic school wouldn't tell me the truth. Why weren't they telling me this stuff? Did they think I was stupid? Did they think I couldn't handle it? You know, I mean, I just, I couldn't imagine why anybody would have taught me this intricate religion when there wasn't a bit of it that was true. And I had just gotten the truth directly from the source. Mm-hmm. <laughs> During the review of religious history that I tell saw, me, tell me. I saw that no one, no one person existed that matches the life story of Jesus Christ. Really? But tell me. That story is composed of little pieces of Egyptian um, mythology, little pieces of Chinese mythology, little pieces of you know what Jewish myth, re- religious beliefs of the time mm-hmm. and a lot of bits and pieces of the lives of a group of wandering what were considered heretics by the Jews who believed that the kingdom of God was coming like right then. Um, and so I saw you know how these bits and pieces came together year decades after the the alleged lifetime of jesus and they were pulled together by religious leaders who were trying to bring basically pagans you know what they would consider to be pagans into the christian religion and so they um, altered christianity Mm -hmm. with a lot of um holidays that are turned into holy days that didn't actually exist you know but they wanted to keep that celebration time together because it appealed to non-jews um and they they needed a figurehead because all religions previously had had a man like god figurehead so they created one Thanks for coming on the show. I am excited to talk about your journey, which is um, practicing law full time and a 270 attorney regional law firm. I was a partner in the firm. I was building my career. You know, I had a national reputation as a health lawyer Mm -hmm. and I was stressed to the max. (laughs) (laughs) Then my firm, um, uh, my partners decided to bring a mobile mammography unit to our parking lot. And so all the women in the firm, you know, could sign up for mammogram. So I did. And a few days later, I got a call saying, we want you to come in for magnification studies and to meet your surgeon. I'm going, my surgeon, what do you mean? (laughs) And so I went in for magnification studies and I was scheduled for surgery to remove three tumors in my right breast. Oh, wow. So it wasn't malignant. Mm -hmm. Then in 2011, and I was diagnosed with uh, stage three metastatic cancer in the other breast. I had the first one um, right before the surgery to take out the three lumps in the right breast. The audiologist and the technician left the room to go get the last set of films developed. And I left too. <laughs> Nobody really? <thought. laughs> yeah. you, just, you just passed right there? Uh-huh. What, what, what happened? As best we can reconstruct, I had anaphylactic shock from the local anesthesia that had been injected into my skin combined with very, very low blood sugar. And so I very, very, very slowly got out of my body and then I popped out and I was standing in front of it going, wow, I didn't know you could do this. (laughs) And, And then I saw blackness, but I wasn't afraid. It was, it was comforting. It was comforting darkness. Mm-hmm. And then I saw a pinpoint of light, and I said to myself, 
oh, I know what this is. I'm supposed to go into the light. Did not have a thought that I died. I just recognized what I was supposed to be doing. So I went into the light and I spent a lot of time alone in the light, feeling those you know, wave after wave after wave of bliss and unconditional love and acceptance and joy. And, and it was like going through me and boomeranging back out and being sent back to where it was coming from. And while I was in the light by myself, I was there for a long time. I started getting downloads, you know, like a computer download directly into my mind of everything there was to know or could ever be known on lots of different topics. A lot of them were things I'd always been curious about while I was living Nancy's life. And they were just there. And I was like, you know, <laughs> bouncing back with back and forth between all these, what I call knowings. And knowing is different than knowing in human life. Knowings that you receive in the afterlife are complete with every single piece of data that could possibly exist about the topic, along with the sense that you have personally lived it firsthand. Mm -hmm. So it's got all the feelings and the emotions and the experience and the sensations and, and everything all in one bundle. And it's all at once. You don't have to learn it. It's just boom, it's there. Wow. So I spent a lot of time doing that. <laughs> I would, so similar to the matrix, like you were literally downloading, they were downloading you. Yes. And when I saw that movie, I was like, oh my God, you know? Um, and it's kind of similar because, you know, in comparison to the afterlife, human life does kind of look like that, you know, planet earth that they showed in the matrix. I mean, it doesn't really look like that, but it's, you know, the, the differences. It's, it's, it's stark. It's stark. The differences. Yeah. Okay. So at this point, have you figured out that you're, you're dead? Not yet. I was doing, because I was a health lawyer, I did a, the way a physician would analyze a patient, you know, I started gathering the facts and I did a review of systems, you know, no breathing, no heartbeat, no this, no that. I'm going, but I can still breathe and I can still see. And, and so then I was like looking and I realized I could see through the back of my head, I could see 360 degrees. I didn't really have a head, but I, could, I had 360 vision. And while I was looking through the back of my head, I saw Nancy's body down in the mammography room. And I saw that she was on earth, but I knew I was in the light. Mm. And that's when I started kind of suspecting. And I said to myself, nah, I couldn't have died. I always heard you go through a tunnel, you know, into the light. And I'm already in the light. I didn't go through any tunnel. And then boom, I'm in a tunnel. And you know how near-death experiencers get these glorious tunnels of beautiful colors and lights, and they travel through the universe, and their friends and loved ones are there to welcome them, or they've got angels. I get dirt. I get a dirt floor with stone walls with moss growing on them. And it looked to me like it was a railroad trestle mm -hmm. from like maybe the 1920s. Because there was, you know, there was a passage overhead, which I think was the railroad tracks. And it was a very narrow passage, but I got the sense it was wide enough for like a Model T Ford to go through. And I could smell the moss. I could smell the dirt. I could feel the humidity on my skin. Really? I could hear the insects. I mean, it's absolutely, completely real. But I wasn't fooled by it. And so I said to myself, fooled by it? What do you mean fooled by it? <laughs> Was I fooled by Earth? And so I did a couple more experiments to see and to prove to myself that just thinking a word manifested that environment. And it, it's true. I learned after doing it three times, I got a download of information about manifesting. There were very, very few English words used in my whole experience. And manifesting was one of them. And it was explained to me that we souls inside human bodies manifest what the body experiences as physical reality. It's all thoughts projected into physical matter. After that, I, I, you know, I realized I had died. And then that seemed to be kind of like a gateway. I saw five beautiful colored lights 
that I knew the names of while I was there, but they would all look white to humans because we have a very narrow color range. And as I was looking at these five lights, I'm thinking, oh, this is a typical Danielson moment. I'm supposed to go into the light and I get five of them. I'm supposed to pick the right one. And a voice, not my own, comes into my head and says, it doesn't matter, just pick one. And the five lights turned into five glowing beings that I recognized as my dearest, deepest, most beloved friends and loved ones from all eternity, none of whom I'd ever known in human life mm. or in any incarnated life. But they were my eternal friends. And I was home. It was the first, it's going to make me cry. It's the first time in Nancy's life I ever really felt home. Mm. And that those were my people. So I spent some time with them and I had a life review. Okay. And unlike the life review that um, most near death experiencers describe, when you go farther into the afterlife than 99% of NDE years ago, you get a life review that includes not only seeing everything from the life that you just lived, but also you get inside the other people who were in those various events. And you get to watch it and feel their emotions and hear their thoughts and be them participating in the same event so that you're seeing your perspective and their perspective and somebody else's perspective. It's all at once. And you get to feel the ripple effect of, you know, like you said something and here's how it impacted these people and here's how they changed their lives and how it impacted other people, you know, way down the stream. Mm. And you also get the answers to all your questions. You know, like all those times you ask yourself, well, why did somebody so do this? And why did I do that? And, you know, what would have happened had, well, you get the answers to all those questions. You get to see, you know, why so-and-so did something because you get inside their heads and you get to, hear their thinking. And then you also um, get to see if you'd made different choices, how they would have turned out. Oh, so you do get like alternative, you know, timelines, if you will. No, they're not really alternative timelines. They're just um, projections of thought about what would have happened, you know, had you done something different. Um, but while all that was going on, I'm saying to myself, been there, done that. So I wasn't really interested in watching that other than to see that every single bit of sensory data that Nancy had ever taken in was all there. Every sky, every sound, every thought, every hope, every dream, every, everything was all there. But I started getting a download of all these hundreds and hundreds or maybe even thousands of other lifetimes I had lived throughout the universe as all kinds of creatures and things. That was a lot more interesting than Nancy's I, life. <laughs> I'd imagine so. Because <laughs> I've already lived Nancy's life. I don't remember the other ones. <laughs> yeah. As they were downloading, I remembered every single moment of every single one of them. And I was just flabbergasted that I could possibly have ever thought I was Nancy. I mean, that was, that was just ridiculous that I could conceive of an idea that I'm just this little human being when I had lived these eons and eons of other lifetimes. And I remembered every single moment of every single one. And so I was like sampling them, you know, remembering, oh, you know, this is like trip down memory lane only. It was mem memory lane was the entire universe. <laughs> After that, I realized I could get knowings on particular topics, like if I focused my attention and intention to know the answer, I could get specific topics instead of just random, you know, things dropping into my head. So, and I didn't know how long I was going to be there. So I thought, well, I better ask the big questions. So I asked, what is God? What am I? What's the purpose of life? What does God expect of me? Where's heaven? Where's hell? And what's the one true religion? Mm -hmm. I asked the last one because I was reared as a Catholic and right. I'd always been told that was the one true religion, which I do completely be true. <laughs> as all of them do. As yes, all yes. <laughs> um, so I got the answers to all those questions. Downloaded. 
you know, in the form of knowings. And after getting all those knowings, I was angry. I'm surprised that you can be angry in the afterlife, but I was angry. I am. I felt betrayed. You know, I felt like everybody knew this but me. I, just, I must be stupider in the dirt if I didn't know this. Everybody's got to know this. And they wouldn't tell me. My parents wouldn't tell me the truth. My church wouldn't tell me the truth. My school wouldn't, Catholic school, wouldn't tell me the truth. Why weren't they telling me this stuff? Did they think I was stupid? Did they think I couldn't handle it? You know, I mean, I just, I couldn't imagine why anybody would have taught me this intricate religion when there wasn't a bit of it that was true. And I had just gotten the truth directly from the source, mm -hmm. literally the source. And I think kind of to calm me down from that, I was shown like a documentary history of planet Earth and how religions developed and how they got to be the way they were when I died and what they were going to be like in the future so that I could see it was a good faith attempt by souls that knew there was something more, but they couldn't figure out what it was. So they were like projecting human life and human thoughts and human speculation and what they knew about humans as a species onto God and onto the afterlife, assuming must be the same. Right. And so that, that did kind of calm me down. Right. I mean, you could just look at Greek mythology. I mean, that's exactly what the Greeks did. I mean, Zeus and they had, they had affairs and they had, you know, kids out of wedlock and they were doing all sorts. I mean, it was just a complete projection of human frailties in the God's world back then. And I did the concept of heaven and hell was very difficult for me to understand that there was a hell. And I'm like, if my mom wouldn't send me to eternal damnation, even though I might've done the worst things. I mean, you could see serial killers, mothers in the courtroom going, he's really a good boy. Like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's so, I couldn't comprehend a God that was so angry and vengeful and egotistical even in, 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 especially in the old Testament where like, you must honor me. You must focus mm -hmm. on me. I need your attention. Like the God, the God I think is not that frail. <laughs> like and the one I met isn't either. <laughs> I'd imagine like he'd be, he'd be like, no, no. If yeah, you need to do exactly what I say. And I need you to honor me and, and pay, pay tribute to me. I'm like, this doesn't make, sense. At least the, the Western religions never made sense. I think I got much closer to the Eastern religions, even though they have their 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 weaknesses as well, but they seem to be a little bit closer to some of them. Buddhism and and you know if I think it's Yogananda who said I love using this quote he goes Jesus died, Jesus was crucified on the cross in one day but his teachings were crucified for the last two thousand years. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Because if you go back to what Jesus was actually trying to say, you know, a lot of times I feel that 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 Christians don't act like Christ. <laughs> well, during the <laughs> review of religious history that I tell saw, me, tell me. I saw that no one, no one person existed that matches the life story of Jesus Christ. Really? But tell me. That story is composed of little pieces of Egyptian. Um, mythology, little pieces of Chinese mythology, little pieces of you know, what Jewish myth, re religious beliefs of the time, mm -hmm. and a lot of bits and pieces of the lives of a group of wandering, what were considered heretics by the Jews, who believed that the kingdom of God was coming like right then. Um, and so I saw, you know, how these bits and pieces came together year, decades after the, the alleged lifetime of Jesus. And they were pulled together by religious leaders who were trying to bring basically pagans, you know, what they would consider to be pagans into the Christian religion. And so they um, altered Christianity Mm -hmm. with a lot of um, holidays that are turned into holy days that didn't actually exist, you know, but they wanted to keep that celebration time together because it appealed to non-Jews. Um, 
and they they needed a figurehead because all religions previously had had a man like God figurehead. So they created one. So you, you said you had you asked six questions. So what are the answers to those six questions? What is God? God is an energy source, has nothing whatsoever in common with humans. It's infinite, infinitely powerful, all knowing, unconditionally loving, has a distinct personality, is creative. And so the person that you love as yourself, that you consider to be the real you, the true you, your identity, your personality, that's the soul, not the body. All mm-hmm. human animals are basically the same. They have the same character traits, they have the same very limited personality. They're, they're really no different than dogs and cats and horses and cows and pigs. We honor them because we're inside them and we bring honor from ourselves as souls mm-hmm. into human life. So all the wonderful good things that you see humans do and all the good things that you know about yourself, that's all you, that's source. That's you operating as source in the physical world. And all the things that you see that are violent and selfish and self-centered and manipulative and evil, that's just typical animal nature. Humans are just animals and they act the same way. And like we don't condemn tigers when they take down, you know, prey in the wild. Humans act the same way, but we condemn them not realizing we're condemning our own animal host bodies. So that's, that answer, so that, that's, that's a, the answer to one and two. Who's that's God and who are we? One, okay, one and two. So what are the rest of the answers? I'm fascinated. Um, what's the purpose of life? I was told that there were three major purposes and two kind of add-on purposes. The major purposes are and what most people, most souls that incarnate want, what their goal is in incarnating, is to gather data about a particular character trait or aspect of physical matter that source can't experience directly. So, and it'll be something that more than one species in the universe experiences. So we don't incarnate just in humans, we incarnate, you know, all over the place. So let's say the thing that you are, you want to study or learn about is um, greed. You will incarnate into every creature in the universe over and over to experience what greed is like from all perspectives, 360 degrees of perspectives. And you'll do that over and over into various and sundry creatures until you've learned all those things that were in the knowings that downloaded into my mind. That's where they come from. They come from sources, intellectual knowledge combined with the experiential knowledge of souls that have incarnated. And so that's what most souls are doing. They're experiencing some, what I call theme, some character trait, some emotion, some aspect, physical aspect of the universe that source can't experience directly. The second, um, more, not as prevalent, but more prevalent than the third, is to incarnate with somebody that you love to be their support person. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if soul A wants to incarnate into human life and maybe it's the first time they've come into human life and soul B has been here a lot. So soul B will come with A and incarnate into something or someone that would make sense as a support person, like a mother or father, brother, sister, rabbi, priest, teacher, coach, you know, something like that. And that soul B's sole purpose for living is to support soul A. And the rest of the time is supposed to be fun. And even when you're studying a theme, when you're not in a situation where your theme is playing out, 
You're supposed to be having fun. And then the third major purpose is to be a catalyst. Like you will incarnate with someone you love in order to do something in their life that will be a catalyst for them doing something that will help them meet a goal. And so that catalyst event may be one time and the whole rest of that human life is supposed to be fun. Mm. And then the overriding purpose is, you know, in the afterlife, I learned that we consider earth to be a very primitive, wild, exotic planet and humans are primitive, untamed, wild, exciting, you know, off the wall creatures. And so we consider it a challenge to incarnate into humans and to try to control them and to try to keep them from acting wild and violent and all those other things. So kind of an overriding goal is to see if we can possibly, even if it's just for a few moments at a time, express unconditional love from inside this wild animal we're riding. And we have to take control of the animal to do that. Where's heaven? It's a state of existence, not a place. It's the state of existence you reach when you're not incarnated. So in between incarnations, we return to heaven. And heaven has, heaven is one stage of eternal life. It's the stage from which we incarnate. There are other stages, you know, kind of like how humans have childhood and adulthood and teenagers. Eternal life has stages like that. So we may grow into the incarnation stage. We may not. We may never incarnate. We may grow out of the incarnation stage and go on and live eternal life doing other things, some of which I did. There's no hell. I watched Source create. I remembered creating the universe and there was no hell created. And at the time that Source created the universe, there was no other entity. There was no you know, comparable evil force or evil spirit. There was nothing but source. Everything that existed is source. So, and then also source told me there's no hell. You know, as you're talking, it's just, I was coming to, when you're saying that there's nothing else existed, you know, I come from the creative, a creative background in, in the film industry and writing and things. And as a writer, you are, the source of the story you are writing all the characters the world everything is all you there is no other force in that process in the creative process so you are literally the god the source of all the characters and you decide whether they die or or live if they go through you know i mean literally the hero's journey as joseph campbell laid it out was about struggle about journey about going through obstacles about all this kind of stuff, but you as the, the sole writer, there is no other version. There's nobody else talking unless you're writing with somebody else or unless you have to deal with a studio executive with notes. <laughs> Generally speaking, you are in control. So th that that concept, as again, as an analogy, makes sense. As a creative, you are the source of the art that you're creating generally speaking and generally it's a it's a writing is a one-off thing painting is a one-off thing music can be a one-off thing but it's like you you create everything around you and there is no other point of view there is no other duality in that does that make sense after that i met back up with my five light being friends and they said well, they didn't say it was all mental telepathy. They let me know that I had to learn how to merge into them so that we could go forward. And so I spent a lot of time merging my energy into the energy of like one of them. And while I was in them, I could pick snatches of physical lives, lives that they had lived. And I could live those physical lives, those scenes. I could live those scenes as them. Yeah. Or I could live them as me, being inside them, being inside physical reality and having that experience. And I did that over and over, you know, like one at a time, two at a time. Eventually, I got to the point where I could merge into all five of them at once. Our energies were totally combined. I 
I felt what it was like to be a being of six, a collective being. And I came to understand that source is a collective being. Because like, you know, you talk about the, the book characters, that, you know, source is composed of its own core nature plus all these mental characters that's created. So I had to get used to that sensation of being part of a collective. And then we kind of moved deeper into the core of source. And I don't know what happened to my, my friends, but I was, I got to a point where I woke up. I woke up to the realization that I am source. And see, I just watched creation and I remember doing it. Mm -hmm. I remember doing it as source. I not only watched, I remembered it. And I'd been merging into these other beings. And I remember that's what it was like. And I woke up and I thought, I did this to myself. I, I, I went into Nancy's life of my own accord. That was my own choice. I created this whole you know, physical universe, this whole life, this way of experiencing myself. But more importantly, I was never alone. I was never unloved. I was never adrift. I was never by myself. I was never unloved. And that feeling was the most powerful thing I've ever experienced in my life. Because I had often felt in Nancy's life that I was out there on my own. You know, I didn't have a soulmate. I didn't, I, I didn't really know anybody like me. And then to, to know that no matter what, I'm never alone. And no matter what, there are two of us. There's a body and a soul. And we're always there for each other. We're never alone. And all the time that I was watching, waking up to the realization that I'm the cre creator, I kept saying in the back of my mind, you know, this is Nancy's eternal personality. Somebody ought to tell those folks. Somebody ought to tell those folks down there. And I was still saying that. And the next thing I know, whew, I'm in a whirlwind on my way back to Nancy. And I'm saying, I didn't mean me. You know, I thought so, somebody ought to tell us. Someone, <laughs> someone should say, I didn't volunteer me. Yeah, I was quite happy where I was. But apparently I, well, it was kind of like this. My intention was that somebody tell those people what Nancy right. learned and experienced. And I was the only one that could do that because I was the only one that ever been inside Nancy. Right. So um, back to the body. Fighting like cats and dogs not to go back into that body because it was right. dead. Right. I mean, she was cold and slimy and how long, how long was she, how long she, was she, uh, oh, I'm talking about she, you, how long were you? Out? I, I was, I was never out. I had you know, I left, never lost one moment of consciousness. Nancy was dead. We're guessing 10, 15 minutes. And it based seemed, on how long the, the other people have been gone. But in then, and but in your experience in your consciousness, it was, it, it, there was no time really. You, when you say you spent a lot of time doing this and you watch a documentary and all this, yeah, a lot <laughs> happens, a lot happened, but for you, the time doesn't really something that a lot of near death experiencers say that there is no, yeah, there's no time. Time, time is an artificial measurement that humans use like inches course, and pounds. Yes. It does. Well, let's see, surgery was in 1994, it was March 14th, 1994. Um, a few months later, I died again, went in, into the afterlife, and I met with a group of spiritual entities, beings, you know, kind of shape like that, who were basically saying, you're not working on your mission. <laughs> How did you die, by the way, the second time? I don't know. I was really iffy 
for years after that. I mean, it was very hard to keep a normal blood pressure, keep normal heart rate, to keep a normal temperature. I mean, my temperature would go down to 95 point something. Wow. Yeah. And my blood pressure would go down to 60 over 30 and, you know, my heart rate would be up and down. And Got it. So it was just, you know, I don't know what took me out. Um, but they basically said, you have a mission, you're supposed to be working it and you're not. So get with the program. So I left my law firm because you know, it took me a few months to kind of like figure out how am I going to work my, my mission while I'm in this law firm? And so I left and went out on my own uh, in October 1st. So from March to October 1st, I stayed in the firm and then I hung out my shingle and practiced law on my own. And I still didn't tell anybody. <laughs> I mean, I, I told my surgeon and he just poo-pooed it. Of course. So, um, you know, that was very discouraging. So it wasn't until I think 2001 when I, or maybe it was, might've been slightly before that, that I met um, somebody from IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, who told me about that organization. And I started going to IONS meetings. And I told my story for the first time at the very first IONS meeting I went to. And when you finally, you know, came out of the closet, as they say, uh, as a near death, or did how did your family, friends, colleagues deal with this new version of you? Because I, I love asking this question of, of near death experiencers because I always am fascinated by the psychology of how you dealt with the people around you seeing this massive change because you were not obviously the same Nancy that you were prior to it. And you're a completely different person with a different set of understandings and knowings. How did your family and friends and colleagues deal with this? And how did you deal with, how did you deal with them not dealing with it? They didn't say a word. Nobody in my family has ever discussed my experiences with me. They know I do podcasts. They know I've written books. They know, you know, nobody said a word to me. My friends in the law firm just thought I was a traitor for leaving the firm. Of course. And they stopped talking to me. And my friends outside the law firm knew I had changed, but I didn't tell anybody why, you know? So I was kind of out there on my own. And for two years, all I wanted to do was just go home again. And I wasn't suicidal or anything. I just, I didn't want to be here. Another common, another common trait of near death experiencers is just like, I just, this is horrible. I don't want to be down here. <laughs> now, I kept like, passing out and, and reliving you know, bits and pieces of my afterlife experience. I don't know if I was going back there or whether it's flashbacks or what, but um, it was, it was hard. But then you finally found your groove, obviously, when you started writing your books. Well, I started writing my books because I was too sick to do anything else. Mm -hmm. um, I'd gone, I, I told you my whole, my body was whacked out and I got to the point where I couldn't even sit up for very long without passing out. And I would go and spend my, my family doctor was trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And he would just have me sit in a patient room while he was like going about seeing other patients. And he'd come back and ask me questions and type up stuff. And he would leave and he'd come back and, um, you know, he gave me medicines to try to keep my blood pressure stable and keep my heart rate stable. And I went through a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then I died again. And, and um, this time I went back, I met the, a different group of beings, but they were the council that were monitoring my mission. And they said, you're not working your mission. We won't hold it against you. You can come home and stay home. We won't hold it against you. Or you can go back into Nancy. If you choose to go back, you will suffer for the rest of her life. And I felt a lot of different things. One was, I didn't want to be a failure. I mean, when source gives you a mission, my God, you do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to fail at that. And I also real, still felt really strongly, somebody ought to tell those people. <laughs> and I was the somebody. 
And then part of me just wanted to see what was going to happen. Because see, I'd seen the future. And I wanted to see how much of it was going to happen. And part of me just felt rotten for leaving Nancy so many times. So I came back in the body knowing we were going to suffer, which we have. But I made her a promise. I will not leave her again until she's ready. I read in your bio that you came back with some spiritual tools. What are the spiritual tools that are inside of all of us, but yet not many of us um, use in our daily, in our daily life? We all have the ability to manifest physical reality. We do it mostly unconsciously. We souls inside of these bodies have created a life for our bodies based upon proving to ourselves the truth of what we truly and deeply believe about ourselves, about the world, and about our place in the world. And we get those beliefs from inside the womb all through life. And a lot of them are just crazy. They're just wrong. And partly they're wrong because we pick them up at an age where we're too young to even understand, you know, yeah. what, what we're thinking, you know, or what we misunderstand what people have said or what they've done. We misinterpret their actions, so, but, but we don't want to get hurt again. So we create all these little rules like we can't do this. We can't do that. And, um, those beliefs are then manifested into physical events in our life. So if we don't like our life, all we have to do is find those rotten beliefs, heal them, and then we'll start unconsciously manifesting much better life. We also can consciously manifest particular events and opportunities into our life. And my fifth book, Create a New Reality, walks through exactly how to do that. Another spiritual power that we have is we can access what I call universal knowledge. That's all sources knowledge database. You know, the same way I was getting those knowings, we can get little tiny bits and pieces of knowings while we're inside the body. But we can get knowings on everything from, like I've gotten bookkeeping advice <laughs> through universal knowledge. <laughs> I've gotten, you know, just practical things, you know, how to go about doing things. And then also we can get, you know, the, the truths of the universe, you know, the truths about ourselves. And one of the things I learned in the afterlife is that we don't put our entire energy into an incarnation. Part of it stays in the afterlife. So you can communicate with the part of you that's still in the afterlife that knows why you came here and can give you guidance about, you know, should you do A or B or C or whatever. Uh, another uh, spiritual superpower we have is self-healing. We can use manifesting to heal these bodies physically and emotionally. We also have what I call multiple simultaneous levels of awareness as a spiritual power. When I was in the afterlife, when I was in the light and I was just getting all these knowings, I realized I could like step back and see myself objectively. Hmm. And then I'd step back from that and see myself seeing myself objectively. And then I could step back from that. And I kept doing that. I kept stepping back and back and getting a wider and wider and broader perspective. Well, we can do that in human life. We call it walking a mile in someone else's shoes. We try to put ourselves into their position, into their perspective so that we can understand them. We don't do that enough, but it's, a, it's an ability that we have. And then the, the fifth one is unconditional love. Hmm. And you know, when, when I, the other half of my mission, besides telling people, was I was supposed to experience unconditional love in Nancy's life. I took that to mean I was supposed to find a man, <laughs> you know, the perfect man. Mm -hmm. Well, in my first IONS meeting, you know, I said that. I said, you know, I, I've been trying, but, you know, I haven't really experienced unconditional love. And the leader of the group looks at me, she goes, Nancy, you can always experience unconditional love. Give it away. Mm -hmm. So those are our five spiritual superpowers. Fascinating, Nancy. I mean, nancydanison.com, D A N 
Oh, shoot. N-A-N-C-I-D-A-N-I-S-O-N.com. And the other one is backwardsbooks.com. B-A-C-K-W-A-R-D-S-B-O-O-K-S.com. And I remembered creating the universe. I remembered doing it myself. I remembered all those things that I was watching as Nancy, as myself, the spiritual being, and as source. And that freaked me out out and I was standing in front of this body going gee I didn't know you could do that <laughs> I'm more awake and more alert and more alive than I've ever been before and I was getting that, that wonderful bliss you know all of a sudden I started getting what I call knowings the answers to all the off-the-wall questions I ever asked in my life just started popping into my head I call them knowings because unlike in human life where you have to learn information by reading or listening or, you know, some external stimulus provides the information and you take it in through your senses. In the afterlife, all there is to know about a particular topic it just downloads into your mind instantly. And that's what was happening to me. And it was complete with a sensation that I knew it. I had learned it firsthand. So all these knowings were popping into my head. One of the biggest knowings that I received was about humans because, you know, here I am in the light and I'm still me. And I'm saying that to myself, hey, I'm still me. And I had always thought that it was my body that gave me consciousness. And it was my body that had the personality. But I was still conscious in the light without the body. And I was the same person I'd always been. The only things that were missing were fear and, you know, greed and jealousy. And, you know, a lot of the things that um, make human life very difficult. Those drives, those instincts belong to the body. And once the body's gone, those are gone. I was told very clearly that I was not my body. My body was a human animal. So I, you know, I was aware the human was an animal. I received kind of like side by side comparisons of what animal traits are, what human animal traits are, and what my natural spiritual traits are. I objectively perceive myself and see myself thinking and then step back and be a whole person in, in front of myself and also behind myself, observing myself thinking. And then I could step back from that and I could be all me, observing all me, watching all me thinking. And each time I step back, and I did it over and over and over, each time I step back, I got a better and bigger and broader and more complete understanding of myself and of life and everything in general. I call that multiple simultaneous levels of awareness. It was absolutely real, as real as anything I'd ever experienced as Nancy. And I thought to myself, nah, so I'm going to do an experiment. My experiment was, I've also heard it called, a, you know, described as a beautiful meadow. Now, I wasn't calling it death or the afterlife. I was just, I've also heard it called a beautiful meadow and boom, I'm in a beautiful meadow, purple haze mountains in the distance, the sun's out, the birds are singing, the flowers are blooming. It's gorgeous. I can smell the flowers. I can feel the breeze. It was absolutely real, as real as anything Nancy had ever experienced, but I still wasn't convinced. So, I thought, okay, one more experiment. I'm just hallucinating all this. I must actually be back in the hospital and I'm on my way over to surgery. Boom, I'm a back in the hospital, walking with the nurse beside me over to surgery. And there's this like purple stripe on the hospital wall that, you know, this way to surgery. And I could smell the hospital smell. I could smell her perfume. I could feel my weight on my feet on the floor. I could feel the wire in my breast jiggling. It was absolutely real. And the word that came into my mind was manifesting. And I was told that the only difference 
between what is it I was experiencing in the afterlife with these three environments that I manifested and what's happening in human life is I wasn't fooled by it. I'm like, fooled by it? What do you mean fooled by it? You know, how can I be fooled by earth life? And I got this huge download of knowings about manifesting and about how we souls inside human bodies manifest a good bit of what human our human experiences. There are two big engines in life. One's biology, which is created by source and governs, you know, all biological nature uh, in accordance with the natural laws that source created. And humans evolved. I watched humans evolve from lower life forms uh, in accordance with the laws of biology. The other big engine is manifesting. And we literally create a physical reality our bodies experience. We do it alone and in conjunction with other souls inside other bodies or souls that are still in the afterlife. So I'm getting this big download about manifesting. It's blowing my mind. More interesting to me was the fact that all these other lifetimes were popping into my memory. I had lived hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of other physical lifetimes throughout the universe, all over the place. And I remember every single one of them, every single moment, all the sensory data, all the thoughts, all the feelings, all the everything of every single one of them, all at the same time. And I was saying to myself, how could I possibly have forgotten who I really am? How could I have forgotten all these life experiences? After I got back all these lifetimes, I kind of felt like I was by myself. And I realized I was getting more knowings. And I, those seven big questions were answered. When I got those answers, I was angry. It wasn't anything like I'd been taught in Catholic school. It wasn't anything like what my parents and the nuns and the priests had taught me. It wasn't anything like I had believed human life was like. I felt like, would, did people think I was too stupid to understand this? You know, Did people withhold this information from me because they didn't think I could handle it? Or, you know, why? Why was I not told all this information when I was in Nancy's body? And it was beautiful. It was simple. It was so, so, so much better than the beliefs I had before I died. Energy source. As I was moving through these layers of sources energy, I got to the point where I got to watch creation of the universe. I saw creation from before the universe existed. I watched, I felt, I listened, I participated in creating the universe. I saw Source, the energy field. Source decided to create a physical matter universe to explore. And it imagined and expelled huge quantities of energy within its own energy field, within its own self that evolved into what we call the universe, time. And so everything in the universe evolved. Source did not create stars or planets or people or things. It just created the imagination and the laws of nature that then evolved into the physical universe that humans know today. I watched planet Earth evolve again from dust and rocks. And I watched the laws of nature, like gr gravity and molecular cohesion and chemical reactions and you know the, the rules of biology all come together to form this beautiful, verdant, green, amazing planet. I watched the creatures develop from, you know, basically chemicals. I remembered creating the universe. I remembered doing it myself. I remembered all those things that I was watching as Nancy, as myself, the spiritual being, and as source. 
and that freaked me out. Then I had this like awakening where I realized I'm source. I remember creating the universe because I'm source. I'm not just this little soul that used to live inside Nancy. I'm definitely not Nancy. I am the source. And so are the rest of us. I watched source take its own self-awareness and create mental characters. And, and those mental characters are what and the ERC and the afterlife as light beings. And I, so I call them light beings. Source created these mental characters, kind of like a novelist creates book characters. And that's what Source did. And the reason we can do that is because we are Source. Source put its own self-awareness, its own consciousness through these light being personalities into physical matter so that it could experience everything that each one of these light beings could imagine from inside physical matter. And I was angry that, you know, I didn't know these things before I died. And I figured that there are other people down on earth who didn't know these things either. And so I thought the only right thing to do was for source to tell those people down there. And the next thing I know, I'm back into Nancy's body. And near death and afterlife experiencers have brought the greatest gift of all time to us, to all of us. You know, the people who have told their stories about being out of body, about, you know, having near death experiences and getting out and, you know, wandering around, they prove, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of them. They prove that the body does not give us life. The body does not give us consciousness. The body does not give us personality. We exist as eternal beings outside these bodies. We are privileged to live inside these bodies and to share a lifetime with a wonderful human being that a lot of times we mistreat or he or she mistreats himself or herself when we could be helping them out a lot more than what we do. We could be controlling their behavior. We could have a much better life, much better environment if we would just wake up and realize we're manifesting. We're manifesting a lot of what happens and we can manifest better. The people who, the near-death experiencers who cross over and go into the light prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is an afterlife, that there is more than just human life, that we survive intact in another place in another state of being i i did not experience heaven as a place it's not a physical environment at all i experienced it as a state of mind or like living in my mind experienced other stages of afterlife and who all every single one agree that source is not an old man with white hair and white skin uh, wearing long white robes source is energy it's pure energy that's all and it's energy with personality and character traits that is unconditionally loving and unconditionally accepting and allows the mental characters in its mind to choose their own lives to choose whether to incarnate 